Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Bob Gagosian, President of the Consortium for Ocean Leadership. The consortium represents over 100 of the leading public and private ocean research education institutions, aquaria, and industries. Together they advance research, education, and ocean policy. Bob has generously agreed to share some of his experience with us. And I'd like to thank you, Bob, for joining us today. My pleasure. So tell us about the consortium. You have a hundred members, and these members represent a variety of ca capabilities and interests. Tell us about, about how this came together and, and what you do together. Well, about uh, five years ago now, uh, two organizations, one called the Joint Oceanographic Institutions, and they manage the Scientific Ocean Drilling Program for the National Science Foundation. In other words, it was an infrastructure program, like right. a big drilling ship and get scientists out to sea to try to figure out, for instance, past climate, evolution of the earth, issues like that. That organization's board wanted to merge with another organization called the Consortium for Oceanographic Research and Education. And what they did was they represented the community on the Hill and with the administration with respect to the importance of the ocean for the future of our country, for that matter, the future of the world. So I had just left my job uh, as president of uh, Whittle Oceanographic Institution. I'd been president for 13 years. And I figured, well, you know, I'm going to kick back now and relax, you know. And uh, it's a funny story because as soon as I pushed the button announcing I was leaving, I was walking home and got home and I said to my wife, well, I did it. And she said, yeah, I know. The answering machine is completely full. <laughs> and she said, the, the board chairs of the two boards want to talk to you. So this was a Friday, and they said, can you come to Washington on Monday and start the merger? And I said, no, I can't, because on Monday, my wife and I and our two sons are going hiking in the Serengeti. But when I get back from the Serengeti, I'd be happy to give you a call. So that was the beginning. And what we do is we basically, our mission is to shape the future of ocean sciences, education, uh, technology, and research. And we do that through a number of ways. The first is we manage these big programs, like the Scientific Ocean Drilling Program. But we also manage another large program called the Ocean Observatories Initiative for the National Science Foundation. And that, that project is basically going to start wiring the ocean like we wire the atmosphere, if you will, to understand the changes the ocean is going through with respect to climate change. But also just, even if climate change didn't change, to try to understand what the oceans are about, how they work. So that's a big project. That's a $400 million construction project and with a $300 million worth of uh, operations and maintenance. And that's exciting because it's a new way of doing business for oceanographers. So you are going to be deploying um, all sorts of um, uh, data gathering uh, right. devices, cables. sensors, cables, and so on that's and so right. forth, and networking these various devices into, into hubs, regional hubs, and then eventually moving that data back to a central hub so it can be analyzed. That's right, and it isn't, it isn't eventual, it's immediate. Mm -hmm. It turns out that the cyber infrastructure, which is kind of the overlay of all this equipment, right. um, there's gonna be four major mooring sites globally in the northern and southern hemisphere, and where the most climate change is occurring, if you will, mm -hmm. um, and then two big coastal sites, one off of, actually we're very close to here in Washington, D.C., in the, in the Middle Atlantic, and the other off of the West Coast, uh, in the Seattle, Oregon area. And all of that data will be immediately transferred to the public by the web. And so the cyber infrastructure is a big deal, and that's a new way, as I said, of doing business for oceanographers. Another key to this, there'll be 57 moorings, by the way. 57. 57. Another That's key incredible. to this, and they have to be turned every year to bring back the, uh, to, to refurbish them. Right. But there's a big cabled piece of this on the bottom of the ocean in the west coast. So that's like a big power cord mm -hmm. for some of the data that we can understand with respect to tsunami formation, right. earthquakes, things like that. So it's, as I said, it's a very exciting way of doing business. So the, these two programs, the drilling program and the ocean observing program, are the programmatic piece that mm -hmm. we do. We also form partnerships between federal agencies and help coordinate and facilitate the federal agency research with private research. Um, a, a good example of the private research is we uh, manage the review process for the $500 million BP Gulf of Mexico Research Initiative. Okay. After the spill, uh, BP decided to give $500 million for research. 
over 10 years, 50 million a year. And so we were asked if we would, if we would manage the review process for them, and we said we'd be happy to. And this is for the recovery of the ecosystems. Exactly, for the rest restoration, and, and also to develop new technologies for safety, mm -hmm. and to also understand, you know, there was this big controversy, where's the plume, is there a plume? And to help develop technologies for that. Where did the oil go, and, and yeah. so on. Exactly, and that's a very exciting project, because it's 10 years of funding. Right. And so that project interfaced with the $350 million that BP, during, from the fines, uh, the federal government gave to the National Academy of Sciences. And then the 100 to $500 million of research that will go from the Restore Act, which is the Clean Water Act fines. That starts to add up to some very significant money for ecosystem studies way beyond the Gulf. For instance, what are we going to do about the Arctic? A spill in the Arctic is going to be very, very difficult to manage. Right. So that's another piece of this. So we view ourselves as sort of the, um, the yenta of, of mixing and matching, <laughs> you know, of these different entities from a private institution like the National Academy of Sciences to a federal institution. So you're the matchmaker, the yenta between exactly. the, the, these various uh, organizations, right. also between commercial interests and environmentalist interests. As you're developing these, um, these networks and these networks start to generate uh, data. Who owns the data and, and who can use the data? Who has access to it? A access to the data is 100% in the public. So it's, so it's completely open? Completely open. It's immediate access except for one particular program and that's, that's the Clean Water Act data at the moment mm -hmm. is being collected for the, the legal challenges that, that BP and the federal government are going to have as to what, you know, what was the flow rate so that makes a big difference what the flow rate was of the oil, of the oil that was coming out of the, of the earth, if you will, because depending on how much oil flowed, they're fined X dollars per gallon. Okay. So if they can determine the flow rate was lower, well, then it wouldn't be X, it would be less than X, and that means the fine would be less. So that data right now is confidential. Once that uh, lawsuit is concluded, which hopefully will be in the next year or two, then the data will all be open. But all the other data is open for immediate access. And in terms of the technology that you're developing in order to deploy these devices, because in, in, a, in a real sense, while you have some technology out there, the actual act of deploying and then refurbishing these devices uh, is going to be actually be a learning curve as well. Um, who has access to that? Who owns that technology? Well, that technology, the, the technology is owned by the public because it's government money. Uh, our organization is going to own the equipment so that we can manage the quote unquote the property management, right. the asset management. And so we'll, we will own the equipment. The implementing organizations, which are the universities, mm -hmm. I mean the, the Scripps's, the Woods Holes, right. the Oregon States, the University of Washington's, um, those organizations will be the implementers of this. And they, they will do the operations and maintenance once the construction is done. And this is an interesting project the Ocean Observatories Initiative, because it's, it's design-build. And some of the technology is not proven. Well, design-build, deploy. Th that's right, design-build, deploy. And, and maintain. Exactly, oh yes. And so it's a real, it's a, another way, a new, new way of doing business, and another way of doing business. For instance, they're going to be building uh, garages that go in the bottom of the ocean. And these gliders will come in uh, after they collect data, dump their data, the data will be transferred through the water uh, to a, to a, mo a buoy, a, a buoy right. mooring string, it'll go up and the data will come back via satellite. So once these gliders charge themselves up, they'll go off and collect other data. But you can also pre-program them to go to certain places that are maybe hot spots in the ocean, or that it looks like there's going to be... When you say earthquake. gliders, are they swimming gliders? They're swimming. They're autonomous vehicles. They're autonomous vehicles. And are, are they right. prop uh, driven? It depends on where they are. If they're on the surface, they can be solar panel driven. Uh -huh. Um, uh, there are a number of other technologies. For instance, they, they are powered by the temperature changes in the right, ocean. Right. And also, uh, in many cases, they're, they're looking at now the salinity changes and the currents in the ocean. Oh, that's interesting. So they, that I hadn't heard yeah, of. So this is a whole new area of, of trying to gain uh, power uh, from the ocean in a very unique way. 
So in a sense, this, this has some touch points to the space program and where, where exactly. technology is going to be driven by the need to discover, uh, in this particular case, the need to discover how global warming is impacting uh, whole ecosystems, um, economic development along the coast and beyond, um, the, the lives of people, and that effort itself is going to develop, uh, drive new developments in technology that, that can be multiply deployed. I mean, a good example is Hurricane Sandy. Mm -hmm. Now they're talking about building seawalls right. you know, to protect. Well, it's not that simple because currents change, and the New York area is a very complicated area because it's, it's sort of like an extended L. Right. If, if you block it here, you're going to push all the water here. So right. how do you do this? <laughs> yes, water does tend to flow. Yeah, so, so, you, so you can't it, just block like it here. It's like the Gulf of Mexico. Yes. The Gulf yes. makes it. Well, once, once the water gets in there and the, the winds get in there, where's it going to go? And you, you, maybe it won't affect uh, New Orleans, but it'll affect Mississippi right. and the other parts of Louisiana or of Florida. So it, it's a very complicated issue. And the biggest... I believe the biggest issue facing the country right now, and probably the world, is the, the nexus between sea level rise and extreme weather events and climate events. And, uh, you know, there are a lot of uh, islands in the Pacific right now where people are abandoning them and moving to places like Australia. Well, think of the cultural changes that are occurring. It's going to wipe out whole cultures. Well, what you're talking about is the nexus between sea level rise and particular types of climate events. So yes. you're, you're, you're talking about the nexus between the uh, sea level rise and humidity and rain and uh, availability of, of sunlight. You're talking about the nexus between um, uh, drought uh, and flood. Um, so much has to do with water. Uh, Absolutely. So much has to do, it's that connection with um, temperature, ocean, water, land. Now, you, you're right on target. It, it, it's very interesting to me that we concentrate in global climate change on temperature. But temperature is not the issue. The issue is precipitation. So when you think of the largest populations on Earth and where they're concentrated, it's in Southeast Asia. Yes. So you've got India and China, which is 40% of the population. Monsoons. Monsoon, that's the lifeblood. Well, they're coastal communities um, exactly. with a hollowed out center um, where water is in short supply in the center. Um, and that is only going to become more extreme where the coastal communities are under threat from storms and rising sea levels and the inland communities are under threat because dry places, arid places become drier. And being able to predict that is going to be key. So, so that's the third leg of the stool of our organization. The first leg is managing the large programs and that provide the infrastructure to actually collect the data and then disseminate the data. The second is the facilitation and coordination of the federal agencies to make all this happen. But the third is uh, basically going to the Hill and to the administration and to get them to understand what the issues are right. and, and move them up on the priority list. I mean, for instance, President Obama's National Ocean Policy, which he, which he signed in, in the law two years ago, that was something that we pushed very hard for. But from the point of view of science being the foundation of the policy, so our role is to make sure the science is front and center on, on all of these uh, advocacy issues for ocean policy. And that's why we're so involved in these acts that I mentioned about the BP oil spill. Um, yes, they're going to replace the casinos and the, <laughs> and the docks. But on the other hand, if you really want to protect the shoreline for the future, how do you get these mangrove swamps back up? You know, they all got wiped out. Yes. They were a natural protection for the, for the Gulf. If, if the Gulf gets another Katrina now, it will be much, much worse than the original Katrina because the buffering is gone. One of the things that is interesting to me, though, is that you talk about these different impacts. How do your projects interact with things like international treaties, uh, international communities, other um, uh, uh, nations that either uh, border the oceans or have interests in the oceans? Um, and, and how do you end up with relationships that allow you to pursue your science and your research, uh, as opposed to get involved in, 
in discussions over diplomacy? Now, that's a very good question. Uh, the Scientific Ocean Drilling Program is an international program. There are many partners. Uh, Europe is a, there are the, the European consortium of 17 countries. Uh, Australia and New Zealand are a partnership. Uh, India, uh, China, Brazil just joined. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it's a very, it's, a, it's an open, if you will, open ocean uh, enterprise. And the way it's done on the Scientific Ocean Drilling Vessel, the Geordie's resolution, is that e each, each country contributes so much to the operation of the ship, and they get so many bunks on the ship. Right. It's, a, it's a very simple business plan. If, if you were to say to me, uh, Bob, I have a country, uh, and I, I would like to get involved in scientific ocean drilling, I would say to you, well, uh, you need to contribute $3 million from your country, and you get two bunks. Uh, and you also get a say in the science and where the ship goes. Uh, the Koreans have just joined as well, uh, and so the South Koreans. And so, consequently, it's it's a it's a very good plan because everybody contributes financially. They gain by going out to sea and getting the samples and sending their own people. But they also gain in the scientific in the process of of where the scientific drilling holes are going to be done. And that project's 40 years old. It's undergoing a renewal now. And uh, I th I, it's probably the most successful international program the National Science Foundation has had. Now, the, the Integrated Ocean, the, um, uh, Ocean Observatories Initiative, now, obviously, that's part of the global ocean observing system, right. okay? And again, a lot of countries are involved in this. Um, it's a very big deal in South America. It's a very big deal, and, and very big deal in the Southern Hemisphere for the following reason. Two thirds of the ocean is in the, in the, uh, uh, where we are. Right. Okay, top half of the globe. Okay, northern hemisphere. One third, uh, uh, but one third of the, uh, uh, two thirds of the ocean, excuse me, is in the southern hemisphere. Right. One third in the north. But where, where is the economy? Economy is in the north. In the north. So we have to do a better job of training, and capac. Well, I would use the term capacity building, and teaching, if you will, and educating so that the countries that, that are bordering, bordering the ocean, they then have the capability themselves to observe. And that's one thing that's going on now with a, with a large number of groups. And it's something that we're starting up as well. So there's a knowledge transfer that is exactly, going on as well. Exactly. So, but our program is U.S. centric. But with that knowledge is being, going to be transfused, if you will, and, and, and transformed and translated to other countries for their use. But along with the training mm -hmm. and the education, that's a, that's a key piece. And, and that's one of our major interests in managing this program. It's so interesting um, what you are doing with, with your partners. It, it, it must be reasonably complex at times, although you have not said anything about it, to herd all these different interests together and to, and to make this organization, particularly an organization that's just recently been merged, uh, function I in an effective way? Yeah, it's a real challenge. Uh, I've been in academia for a long time and, and I've been managing organizations for 20 years now. And people say, well, so what's it like to manage faculty and manage deans and directors? And I said, well, it's kind of, it's, it's not like herding chickens uh, because chickens aren't very smart. It's managing jackals. <laughs> because jackals bite your ankle and they don't let go. Right. And they're very smart. Yes. But they're very persistent. Yes. And what you're trying to do is get everybody on board so that everybody wins. But of course, everybody has their own agenda of what the best science is. Right. And because of the way the tenure system is set up, you know, you get tenure because it's about you, 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 and your ideas. Right. It's not about anybody else's ideas. Right. And that's a real problem and a barrier for people working together as a team. Uh, on the other hand, the senior leadership of, of most of the fields understands this. That they've, had, that they've got tenure, they're full professors, whatever. And they're looking for, you hope they're looking for a greater good. Right. And to work as a team. And we're very fortunate in both these big programs that that's the way this, this is operated. So your approach is to uncover the intrinsic motivation that these people Absolutely. have that go beyond the patina of 
uh, who they are and what deanship they have and what their title is and so on, go back to almost first principles is why they got into involved in this, in this profession in the first place, in the research in the first place. What's your passion? What's your passion? That's, What's your passion? That's, that's what we look for. Do you see part of your job is to help people to follow their passion or follow their bliss? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I enjoy that a lot. Um, as I said, I've been, I've been around, and, I, and what I want to do is give back to the community. Um, the community gave to me a lot when, when, when I was managing Woods Hole, but also when I was doing a lot of other things around the world and cruises and everything. And I feel that I wanted to come to Washington and give back. I mean, uh, people said, so what, what do you really do? My kids said to me, my boy said to me, so Dad, what do you do on a daily basis? I said, I think all the time about how do I hire the best people? Because, because if I hire the best people for a job, they'll be so good, they'll get bored with that and want to do something else. And they'll say, you know what, I really want to make a difference. So I figure what a CEO should first realize is they're not that smart. You know, yeah, they're okay smart, but you know what, there are a lot smarter people around them. Why not have a whole organization of smart people telling you what to do as the CEO? instead of you telling them what to do. And then enabling their ideas. It, absolutely. Now, you, you have to have it fit the mission. Uh, right. and that's your job. Because you don't just want to have a helter-skelter all over the place. You want to fit the mission. And so that's what my job is, to make sure that those all line up and fit the mission. It's fun. And it's, and it's fun. Yeah. And it's fun. What can be better, having a job yeah. that's fun and, and actually accomplishes something for humanity? Exactly. Well, Baba Gagosian, thank you so much for spending time with us, and thank you for your insights. No, you're very welcome. It's been thoroughly enjoyable. It's great. It's great.